The Oklahoma City Thunder won game one, but should they tweak some things in game two, like their rotation? You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and inside the Thunder beat writer, Rylan Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Rylan underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunder Pod. On today's show, we're diving into the Thunder possibly tweaking their rotation, some key adjustments for game number two, and a look at the past versus the present. Today's show is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I have to admit, I do have a bit of a competitive side. I'm a big fan of Monopoly Go. Monopoly Go is incredible. It's a mobile hit twist on the classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go. It's now free on the App Store and the Google Play Store. Well, well, well. Sunday has came and went. The emotions of the game are now trending down, and you can just look forward to game two. And no matter how you got there, you got to a 1-0 record after the first game. When you look at this series, I think that you still should be feeling very positively about this series and about the Thunder and about game number two. We'll take your mailbag questions on today's show, and we'll continue on this week, breaking it all down. But this first question comes from at Steel by Shea. Should the Thunder start Kaysen or Jay Will over Giddy for this series? Either emphasize defense and put Kaysen on CJ all game while allowing Dort to hound BI or uh, Jay Will to guard uh, Valanciunas so Chet can roam weak side help. So I, I still believe the same thing that I believe during the regular season. You know, the, the starting lineups don't particularly matter as much as the closing lineups do because the Thunder have shown a willingness and an ability to quickly adjust if things are not going right to begin the game. I think that this could be a series where maybe Josh Giddy is, is not tailor-made for it. I'm not ready to say that and, and officially dub that just yet. So you mentioned here about Kaysen Wallace. I think it's a great point that he did a fantastic job on defending CJ. We'll talk about Kaysen uh, later in this answer, but when it comes to Josh Giddy. The Thunder held the Pelicans to 17 first quarter points by starting Josh Giddy. So, so emphasizing defense, leaning in on defense, uh, it wasn't as though that was the problem. The Thunder held the Pelicans to 92 total points, right? Whereas the upside of sticking with that starting five is this is a team that Josh Giddy has found a lot of success against. This is a team that Josh Giddy has been able to uh, help you play a guy like Valanciunas off the floor along with the fact that he can't guard Chet. And so the upside is if he can get there, if he can get back to what he's typically done versus New Orleans offensively, then you are on the verge of just stomping out a Pelicans team that doesn't have Zion Williamson and that uh, has a Brandon Ingram stopper in Lou Dort. And you can always fall back to the Case and Wallace safety net. That's always going to be there. But the risk versus reward, I think that lost in last night, lost in the fact that he didn't have a huge uh, offensive night, lost in that is that Josh Giddy played really good defense for his standards. And again, it's not as though he went out there and played excellent point of attack defense. That's not his role. His role is to play a really, really good team defensive you know, skill set and be your fifth best defender. He handled that obviously excellently. 17 points after one, 43 points at halftime. So I, I think that the cost outweighs, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the reward outweighs the cost of, of staying with Josh Giddy in the starting lineup. Now, do you uh, close with Casey Wallace? Do you quickly go to Casey Wallace? Absolutely. If things are not turning the right way offensively for Josh Giddy, because at that point, uh, if things are if things still turn badly for Josh Giddy offensively, or not even badly, just like you know the shots aren't falling, for example, then you have no choice but to go to Casey Wallace in, in a playoff game like this, 
where you can immediately upgrade defense, even though Josh played his role really well defensively last night. Uh, you immediately upgrade the defense, and then you upgrade a, a more sure-handed uh, catch-and-shoot guy for the driving kick penetration stuff that you want to get to in game number two. So as far as the starting lineup, I think that that should remain the same for game two. I also believe that the closing lineup should remain the same for game two. So uh, I, I think it's that part of it could be unchanged. Now, there are some rotational tweaks I think that you know the Thunder are going to have to get to as we'll go on and discuss. For the J-Will part of things, the J-Will versus Giddy debate, you go back and watch game one, I think people are blinded by you know, Valanciunas' stat line. You go back and watch game one. I put a super cut up on Twitter at Rylan underscore Styles. You're going to find that Chet Holmgren played really good defense and was in the right position and was making life tough on Valanciunas. He made more tough shots than he typically does. I think that'll come back to you know, the, the, the average. And even if it doesn't, this is not some dire puzzle to solve. The Pelicans scored 92 points. I still feel extremely confident in my take before the first game on this very show, and the keys to game one, discussing how the Pelicans playing through Jonas is like them bunting down the first baseline in baseball. They're giving you the out. They're just handing it to you. Go take it. Go take it, throw it at first. Because to get Valanciunas to that stat line, to get him you know, that involved offensively, it's at the cost of slowing the game down. It's at the cost of scoring closer you know, to the shot clock violation, you know, to the 24-second clock. It's at the cost of you're not spraying it out in those possessions. You're not even getting threes up from CJ, B.I., and Herb Jones in those possessions. You're settling for... Uh, a, a hook shot in the in the restricted circle that that Chet is there to contest, and we've seen that history this season shows us this is a year in which Valanciunas will miss some of those bunnies and easy looks, and sort of compound the problem that way. So I think that while it will revert back to to normal, even if Valanciunas duplicates that exact game seven straight times, the Thunder will win will still win four before the Pelicans do, because when the game slows down. If you want to get into a slow twos game, you've got number two in Oklahoma City. And if it if it takes scoring late in shot clocks inside the, the arc, I'm taking SGA every single time. Not to mention what you can do beyond the arc, what you can do off of that. The Pelicans are not able to, to do consistently. And here's another kicker for, for the J-Well and, and Chet duo. I think both can be true. I think that Jay, I think that Jay will play really well on Sunday. But you, if you played them together, you would then have to match minute for minute with Chet and Valanciunas because there's no one to spell Chet at that point or Jay will if they're both on the floor at the same time defending Valanciunas because you certainly do not want Kenrich Williams defending Valanciunas. You, you saw that the Thunder planned on putting Kenrich Williams in the game. And then immediately shoved them back to the bench whenever the Pelicans countered with, with Nance coming out for Alan Shunis. That's no shot at Kinrich. I think that he played well also on Sunday. But that's just not the body you want on Valen Shunis. So this way, you look at game one, Chet, Chet defended Valen Shunis the best you could ever ask him to. And frankly, defended Valen Shunis as good as Jay Will did, and, and as good as Jay Will did last year as well in the play-in, which he's done very well these last two postseasons. And it lets you keep your depth intact where you can still have Jay Will off the bench. So I, I think that the down low rotation was good from Oklahoma City as well. Are there spurts where you can play them together? Absolutely. There will be moments and, and, and timing that, that you want that to happen. I think one of those times could actually be if you, if you come out firing tomorrow and you extend a 12, 15 point lead and we know basketball is a game of runs, maybe to keep that momentum when Valanciunas is on the court, you put them both in to help yourself on the glass And because what's the biggest threat to you in terms of uh, the Pelicans at that point trying to erase and chip away at a 15-point deficit? It's going to be their three-point shooting. What's the biggest threat of their three-point shooting? It's going to be second-chance three-point shots where you get a board and kick it out. With the Thunder having to swarm the rebounds and swarm the glass, you're susceptible to corner threes. 
Whereas if you counter that with putting both guys in, you can not only maintain your 15 point lead, but likely grow it as they both have offensive threats to them, to their game. But can you do it for a sustained amount of time? I don't think so because of the challenges it presents to your depth. But it can be true that Kaysen played great and Jay will played great and they were awesome options while also not make, not having to make wholesale changes because of it. But I think that, that Kaysen deserves a ton of flowers for how he handled that game. I mean, you look at the just the last possession, you cannot defend it any better. Yes, CJ got a prayer heave off that could have gone in. But that's the exact right move as a rookie to, to live with that shot. You live with it. Just like Paul George lived with Dame's shot and, and it went in. And he waved you off the floor. Congratulations. You live with that shot. You don't foul and put CJ on the line to, to, to go and, and help you uh, help the Pelicans move past this game. Force him to make that difficult shot. And I think that Jay will deserve credit for the edge that he brought. You were getting tangled up with Alan Tunis and knocking down the three and staring him down. Like that stuff matters, especially in a, in a playoff series, which will continue to get heated. I think Jay will brings you the ability to hit threes and be a DHO playmaking hub, and, and that stuff is great. And all three guys will be a massive role, Chet included, um, in the rotation moving forward and, and should increase their minutes in this series specifically. But how you get there, I don't think is changing the starting lineup. Coming up, let's talk rotation. Let's, let's talk it all through on today's show. Plus, what are some key adjustments Oklahoma City has to make? But first, I want to tell you right now about our good friends over at Prize Picks. Check out Prize Picks right now because guess what? Prize Picks is the number one sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest, most exciting way to get in on the action while watching your favorite sports and players. You pick more or less than their Prize Pick projections on two to six players, and boom, you can win. You can even win. A hundred times your money, folks. That's 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 sensational. You can turn ten dollars into a thousand dollars in the NBA playoffs, in the Stanley Cup playoffs, and baseball's in full swing playoffs. Go there right now and check it out today at Prize Picks. When you do, use code Locked on NBA by downloading the app. Code Locked on NBA for the first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's code Locked on NBA. For the first deposit match up to $100. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Folks, are you watching Fox Sports and ESPN all day? Do you notice you have to turn down the volume due to all that shouting? Well, make the switch to Lockdown Sports today, a free 24-7 streaming channel programmed with your every day content to bring you the biggest stories without any of the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you the can't-miss analysis, opinion, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube, free on Amazon Fire TV, Channels app, and part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's dive into more of your mailbag questions. Obviously, the rotation will be a big deal. Zach says, do you think the Thunder will shorten the rotation as the series goes on uh, or more of a night-to-night thing like it was in the regular season? I think it's closer to a night-to-night thing. I think that it will be a tighter versus shorter situation. I think that when you look at it, the Thunder still might play nine to 10 guys a night. I don't think that they'll play 11 consistently throughout the playoffs like they did on game one. I think that they'll consistently play nine to 10 guys though. And maybe technically those guys checked in But when you actually review the minute total, I think as the season goes on, as the postseason goes on, you'll see an increase to SGA, an increase to Chet, an increase to J-Dub, an increase to Isaiah Joe off the bench, an increase to to, to these guys, uh, and Lou Dort, to, uh, yes, you did play the same amount of bodies, but you spread out and disperse their minutes differently as the, the games go forward. I think Mark made a great point at the availability on Monday discussing his rotation, discussing you know, how, how many guys he played, which is unconventional and, and postseason standards. And he talked about how you know, it's not as though, you know, just to, to kind of paraphrase it, it's not as though they're married to doing this in the postseason, but a key point of doing it in the postseason in game one was that 
it's almost as though you've got it out of the way, right? So, so imagine this. Imagine the Thunder go to game one and they pick eight guys and say, these are the only eight guys that are going to play tonight. And they're the wrong combination of eight guys. And maybe you still win game one, but, but it's clearly the wrong combination of eight guys. And so, yes, you're one and oh, but now you're in game two. Now you need to, to, to add someone to the mix. And now this is their first playoff game. And you don't know how they're going to react. You don't know how they're going to take in the scenes and the environment uh, and, and the pace of the game that changes and the, and the physicality of the game that changes and all that comes with it. No offense to the rest of the roster. Short of an offense defense, like here's a here's a two second possession after a dead ball where you put in Lindy and Muscala and them. Everyone who has a chance to make a legitimate contribution in the postseason played on Sunday. They got to experience it. They got to put it behind them of their first this, first that. And now you move forward. That's a benefit you have as the one seed. That's the benefit you have of a really deep roster who you can trust to put guys out there. And so I think that uh, it made sense to go that deep. But as the postseason progresses, like the only thing about the rotation that jumps out to me is I think you have to get Wiggins more minutes. A way to do that is cutting Hayward's minutes, although Mark made a point he was, he, well, he was asked about Hayward, to be clear. Uh, and he did praise Gordon Hayward and his ability to, uh, while well, he didn't score, uh, he rebounded and, and helped them defensively as a veteran who's kind of been in that spot, which, you know, to Hayward's credit, he did help them defensively and he did rebound very well. Uh, and, it, and it was a nice body to pair with, with uh, Kenrich in the small ball lineups. But I still lean Wiggins myself, obviously. Uh, I could be wrong on that considering uh, where Mark stands. But we'll continue on with your mailbag questions, including talking about this question from OKC Hancho. Speaking of Mark's uh, availability, what are your thoughts on the decision from Mark to challenge the jump ball uh, and, and the way the refs handled it? So Mark explained now two days in a row, you know, how this was an inconsistency from the officials. The way that it was described at the scorer's table was the way it was handled back in Utah earlier this year and the way that Mark understood the rule to be, which that interpretation of the rule, which I think is the right one, the right interpretation of it, uh, is the reason why th that the odds said to go ahead and challenge it. So the thought process was, and I mentioned yesterday that it didn't seem like uh, it, it was within Mark's typical thought process, but whenever you actually spill it out, uh, you know, it made more sense uh, whenever he did that on Monday. So you look at the challenge, and me personally sitting there, and, and Daniel Bell can attest to this, I, I was just beside myself. I, I, why would you challenge this? Because you have Chet Holmgren. It sounds as though you have, uh, you know, Isaiah Joe in the circle. No offense to Joe. Like, you have a guy who's going to go win your jump ball almost assuredly. Well, why would you challenge this? The explanation from Mark was that, you know, they thought it was a 60-40, hey, you know, it can be our ball here. At worst, right? At worst, it's Pelicans basketball. You get your challenge back. You get your timeout back. But the review is going to, you know, in this part I'm interjecting here, the review is going to take some time. So it's almost as though you've stolen an extra timeout and you've stolen an extra, you know, you know, gathering process with the shot to get the ball back. So you're basically taking the wrong outcome of a 50-50 jump ball between Nance and Chet, uh, if you're wrong, right? But you're getting a timeout for it. You're, getting, you're, you're keeping your challenge for it and away you go. And you have a shot still to go ahead and win uh, the challenge and in the sense, win the challenge in the sense of uh, have the advantage from the challenge and keep the, and keep possession. So the way Mark described that does change things. Like if, if you're at a 50, 50 jump ball and now you go to a, a replay system and, and let them decide it versus letting the ball getting thrown up, decide it uh, at that point, I get it. Cause you've, you've then grabbed the timeout out of the ordeal and, and talked to a young team in that moment. What actually happened was the worst case scenario where the refs got it wrong and uh, you, you lose your challenge and you lose a timeout. And now you only had one remaining down the stretch. Luckily that did not come back to cost Oklahoma city, but it could have, and it could have cost them in a massive way and could have cost them in a massive way, not to Mark's fault to the officials fault, because it put it into perspective. Everyone's been asking and DMing and, 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 and commenting, you know, was this the, was this the right call from the refs? It, it was certainly not. Now, this again is now we're switching back into my voice here, not Mark's. 
Mark is asking for, for the NBA to clarify things. He said he hadn't ha had clarification yet on Monday afternoon. From my standpoint, it was clearly the wrong decision by the refs. Like there is, there's no way that a challenge can be interpreted that way because that's not how we handle any other challenge in the league and not how the NBA handled it a couple months ago. For example, if you go challenge a foul call and they change it from a, a foul on Shea to a foul on J-Dub, you're still the disadvantaged party, but you also still keep your challenge and keep your time out. This is the same exact thing. The ruling on the floor was a jump ball. They've changed the call to the Pelicans basketball. You're the disadvantaged party, but you've gotten the, you've gotten the verdict changed, so you keep your time out and keep your challenge. So from that standpoint, I think that the refs did not handle it the right way at all, uh, which is tough to say because at the table they did handle it the right way, but someone buzzed down and 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 mixed it all up. But I, I think that you know the the, the decision making process there from Mark uh, made a lot more sense once he got to explain it on Monday in, in more clarity of like why he decided to challenge it, um, and had the officials handled it the right way, I think. I think it's a, actually a smart decision, even though you lost the possession. Because there's a shot, you lose the possession anyway on the jump ball. And your benefit was you could have gained the possession and you certainly gained the timeout. But it fell through because of how the officials handled it. Coming up, what are the biggest adjustments Oklahoma City has to make in game number two? Who wins a fight between a Pelican and a Bison? And how does this team stack up to the first iteration of the Thunder? But first, I want to say right now, about our good friends over at BetterHelp, check out BetterHelp today because sometimes there's stuff you need to let off your chest. There's stuff you need to talk about. You don't want that festering uh, and, and, and really starting to get to you. You want to let it out, and BetterHelp is there to help you do that. Whenever you go to BetterHelp, you get the licensed therapist, and you fill out this questionnaire. They'll match you with one of the licensed therapists, and away you go. It is completely and totally suited around your schedule. I think that that's a big hiccup. I think that people can acknowledge, hey, I could benefit from therapy. But what typically holds them back is the fact that, like, I, I don't have time. I don't have time to go to an actual brick-and-mortar store or a brick-and-mortar building and, uh, you know, find a therapist and, and be in person. Whereas with BetterHelp, it's completely around your schedule, completely online. You can do it anywhere. Uh, and it's great. And, and, and they're there for you with licensed therapists. So go check them out today and get the benefits of therapy. Give it a try at BetterHelp. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked in MBA. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked in MBA for 10% uh, uh, off your first month. BetterHelp dot com slash locked in MBA for 10% uh, off your first month. Also want to say right now that I have a competitive side to me, and that's why Monopoly, Monopoly Go is the best place for you to let out that competitive nature. Monopoly Go is great. So it's a it's a mobile twist on the classic Monopoly game downloaded by over 150 million people. What, what's fantastic about Monopoly is I, oftentimes it's tough to get everyone in a room and play Monopoly. You get all the, all the best parts of Monopoly traveling to these crazy locations, building up these amazing cities, uh, most importantly, gaining yourself big money, pulling off bank heists and, and, and tormenting your friends. But it's all on the go. It's all on your phone. And it's a constant leaderboard shifting. And it's a lot of fun uh, to discuss with your friends and, and uh, wreck their city at times. Uh, so go there right now and download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store or Google Play Store. Check it out today at Monopoly Go. Monopoly Go is there for you to have fun in the classic mobile twist on Monopoly. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. CD asks, what's the adjustments that you're looking for in game two and the rest of the series? So first and foremost, hit your open shots, but I'm dumb. Yeah, of course. More in depth than that. I would love to see the Thunder get back to playing quicker and faster offensively. Shea penetrating right away, collapsing the defense, driving and kicking, that kind of stuff. More, more fluid motion away from the ball. I think that the, that the first bucket of the game 
was an exact advantage for Oklahoma City. You had the spacing. You gave it to Shea. Shea had the gravity to force a double. Giddy cuts through. And, and off that cut through, Chet now relocates into a passing window, gets the feed from Shea. He's wide open. Chet knocks down a three. And away you go. I would love to see that the Thunder not only get into their action quicker and have Shea penetrate quicker, but run more five out stuff. Run more five out stuff and get Chet more involved. I mean, I'm sorry, get Chet more involved, but also put CJ into actions more and start to play him off the floor on that end of the floor. And then if the if the Pelicans are still gonna guard Chet with Valanciunas, again five out stuff, but have Chet at the top and have Chet with the ball in his hands to show that like you just can't do this. You cannot defend the Thunder this way with Valanciunas on Chet. So those are all things I think that they can do on the offensive end. Defensively, I genuinely believe that they played really good defense. Like, yes, they let up some open corner threes. A lot of those you live with, right? Like a lot of those are from guys who, if they get hot from three like, and beat you, you shrug your shoulders and you move on. Like, like yes, a few were from Trey Murphy that you that you do not want, but that's going to happen in every game. Uh, the, the Pelicans don't want, you know, Chet Holmgren hitting open, you know, getting open threes, uh, even if he even if he misses some of his six threes and goes two for six. So uh, I think that the, the Thunder defense was really, really good. Now, offensively, they can clean some things up beyond just shot making. And I would also love to see more Aaron Wiggins minutes. But I'm always going to love to see more Aaron Wiggins minutes. Uh, Thunder Topic says, what do you credit the fourth quarter struggles to? It was uncharacteristic for the most part. Shea had three turnovers. Uh, Mark's challenge was uncharacteristic. We talked about that. Uh, I look at it and I wonder how much of it was the six-day layoff. Like the six-day layoff mixed with the excitement of the postseason was more so like, oh, the lights are too bright or they're too inexperienced. Because when you get down to it, the two biggest plays came from Murkies <laughs> and Chet Holmgren and Casey Wallace. And, and when, when you also look at it, the vast majority of the roster was playing in their first playoff series, in their first playoff game. And even if you want to count, you know, it was seven of 11 that made their, their playoff debut, but, but I would even throw Lou Dort in there as like seven and a half out of 11, because yes, Lou Dort played in the playoff series you know, in the bubble. He didn't play in this environment. He didn't, he didn't play in this kind of a playoff series. It's like seven and a half made their playoff debut and the thunder held the Pelicans to 92 points and won the game. So I, I, I would be curious to see how game two goes. Obviously I feel very confident We'll look back on this this course over the next two days uh, and, and the fear factor and, and get a hearty laugh out of it because I think that it wasn't anything more than they had six or eight days off and they and they didn't really know uh, how to how to respond in the sense of like they didn't maybe that's not the right ch choice of words but uh, it was just the natural rest versus rest conversation the shots didn't fall go back and watch game one again I'll say it I'll say it till I'm blue in the face Kenrich. Joe, Chet, like Shea, like all these guys missed good, high quality looks that they typically nail. That will change on Wednesday. That will change on Wednesday. We have some more questions, a couple about the past versus present. I did want to uh, talk all about this series for as long as we could and, until getting to this point. We'll, of course, have more shows for you. This is still a jam packed week. We're not slowing down any time soon uh tomorrow's show will, will be about previewing game two uh we'll have the game to recap but before the game to recap in between those two we'll have a bonus podcast of the keys to game two uh, and the storylines to follow in game two and we'll, you'll just have so much thunder content you cannot uh you know you're, you're beside yourself as you have all week long after 20 pods <laughs> we're doing some more but let's talk about kind of the past and present here RK Anthony says, uh, at the same point of their career, Shea or Durant, who would you pick? I'd pick, I'd pick Kevin Durant and, and just build better around him. <laughs> no offense to Shea. Uh, Shea is a fantastic option. You can make the case that Shea is an easier guy to build around than the Thunder have ever had just in the raw sense, you know, in the sense of on paper, he can play such a multitude of positions. But Kevin Durant's the best player to ever play in Oklahoma City. I know that there's baggage and emotional history to it and, and the personality traits and everything else you want to look at. but. Um, you you give Kevin Durant skill set, this roster, this depth, um, this coaching staff, things are looking up for Oklahoma City even more than they already are. And Shea can, can get to that point, I'm sure, but I don't think it's a hot take to say Durant's better than Shea all time. Granted, there's nothing I'd really change about the center team. 
because Colin asked, what's the what's the big difference between the the 2012 roster and, and and kind of era compared to this, and will this team be able to get over the hump? You can never guarantee a championship because you never know what's going to happen. I am willing to guarantee, and this is going to be a bit of a hot take because the other the other squads actually got to the finals, so like you can't really get closer than than that to a championship. But this roster is easier to build a championship roster around. They have the depth. They have the coaching. They have the stars fitting together. Maybe the stars, you know, and, and we're talking, you know, Shea, Chet, j already. Maybe those stars are not the, their 1% ceiling isn't as high as Russ, isn't as high as Kevin Durant, their 1% ceiling. But what they reach of their ceiling and, and their compatibility scale is going to be more compatible than those guys were on the court. And I think that they're going to have this, this, the experience of, you know, everyone was growing for the first time you know, in 2012. Like the city was growing around basketball. Sam was still growing in his role. The team was growing, 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 right? Sam's been through a rebuild. He's, he's been through two of them now, but he's been through a building a, with a contender. He's seen what pressure does to teams and uh, how you should react in situations, how you should, you know, make moves what all you should consider when making moves. Like he has the, 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 you know, knowledge of what went right and wrong in the initial run. And this team has way more assets uh, in, in the future for flexibility than that, that first run did. So in terms of just building it out, I think that, that the Thunder are the best shape they've ever been in, which is, which is insane to say, honestly, because of they were the best ran pro sports team, one of the best in all of sports, right? There was the Patriots. It was, it was the Patriots and them and the Spurs. And like, it was those, those teams. They're quickly going to be there with the chiefs and with the uh, other pro pro teams around, around sports. Uh, big Rex ask in, in a real life battle, hand to hand combat, could a Pelican defeat a bison? No, no. You kidding me? Could a pelican defeat a bison? Are, are we? Are, is there any weaponry involved? Like, is the pelican going to be uh, you know, made into a, a centaur type of uh, creature? No. What is he going to do? You can't swallow the bison with that big beak. Uh, what is he going to do? He's not a particularly great flyer. You land on the back of a bison. Guess how long that's going to last you. And if he's forced to stay in an enclosed kind of cage and, and grapple with a bison, taking the bison against almost anything else in the league. You, you look around and we get into some weird territory here because there's like ships and there's the sun uh, with, with the, the actual suns and the heat. I mean, how, I mean, how much heat can a bison withstand? I think, I think a large deal Considering that we have a lot of bison in Lawton, Oklahoma, you look, at, you look at the temperatures out there, it's a scorcher a lot of the time. So I, I feel good about them against the heat. Wolves, I, I feel good about the bison. Not great, honestly. I think I think a wolf can can out-tactic a bison. No offense to Rumble. Um, a bull and a bison, same family. So is there any sort of loyalty there where maybe uh, Rumble being more cutthroat than Benny might help him out? Um, a 76 sir. again, are we looking at Benjamin Franklin coming back to life with a key and a kite? Uh, I, I know you see it, right? But I think that a bison just kind of bowls him over. I'm, I'm going through the Rolodex of teams. I don't really know where Rumble would fall. You know, a maverick, it's just, a, it's just a horse. You get an angry horse and an angry bison. I'm leaning bison. A spur. You stick that sucker into Rumble, it's going to hurt. But what qualifies as beating a spur? Would stomping on it and bending it out of shape qualify as a victory for Rumble? Probably. Although their mascot's a coyote. It's the wily coyote that, that kills the bats. He's got a great track record versus bats. There's no bat team yet until we get expansion. So I'd take I mean, well, a coyote, though. Coyotes are tenacious. They might have the bison at that point. So that's tough. Who who do we give the spurs to? Coyotes or or actual spurs that go in the boots? 
rockets. I mean, that's a whole ordeal. How how do you how do you break your rocket? And do they get the benefit of of takeoff in the cage? Because not only can it lead to explosions, but at the very least, a fire coming out of the end of it, uh, lighting a bison on fire seems like a pretty big win. A grizzly. It depends. I mean, some grizzlies are kind of gentle giants, look like Tarzan, play like Jane type of thing. A jazz is an interesting one. Goes back to the spur. How do you beat a jazz? Um, can you just you know defeat the clarinet and the saxophone? Or are we talking about a jasmine? And at that case, how sharp's the end of the flute? It's an interesting question. More of an off-season topic. I'm really going to stew on this for uh, for quite some time. How many assets does the king have? I'd wonder. Do you, do you have a whole a whole pillage of of peasants that get to come with you? Uh, or are you just stuck uh, looking at King George? That's not going to be a good look for the you know for the king over the bison. Warriors obviously come with some weaponry. I think that we've seen history shows us that the bison has no chance against warriors. Uh, if we want to be historically accurate, what a what a dumb show, huh? Anyway, thanks for listening. <laughs> it's been a lovely cruise. Until next time. Be good and be good to one another.